Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 73, the knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week, a few cool things to talk about, including what are the most important elements that go into any given knife, and also, what's the big deal with S30V? Let's get right into it. All right, folks, if you're new to this series, welcome. What you do here, or what we do here, me and Thomas behind the camera, that is, we uh, check out our comments section below these FAQ videos and we pull out some good questions to feature in a future episode. So, to get one of your questions featured on a future episode, or at least have a chance, do that. Leave the, uh, the question right down there in the comments. Uh, this week, first comment question comes from Max Level EDC. Hey DCA, please order the importance of these characteristics in order of importance. Ergonomics, blade geometry, blade length, steel choice, handle material, lock choice, heat treatment, opening method. Kind of a trick question as context is everything. Choose your own context. Thank you. Well, I, I shall do that then. Um, I'm gonna, what, the way I want to look at this actually, I, I kind of breezed over this question the first time. I was like, eh, yeah, whatever. But the more I thought about it, it's actually a pretty important uh, or, or an interesting way to think about things anyway. So I'm going to rank these things in kind of a hierarchy of needs. Go from not a knife all the way up to the ultimate in knife whatever. Um, but the first thing you need, absolutely the most important element in any knife, no matter what style, no matter what size, is the heat treatment. Because if it's not heat treated, it's just a hunk of metal that's shaped like a knife. Full stop. You gotta have it heat treated well, absolutely number one. And it doesn't have to, that's far, far more important than steel choice. And, you know, you look at something like this SE5. Simple 1095 carbon steel, but Rowan especially is known for getting a, a lot of performance out of that steel because it's all in the magic of the heat treat. And we kind of talk about it as being like the magic or the mystical element, even though it is very scientific because we can't really see it happening uh, unless you're dealing with like microscopes and that sort of thing. So heat treat, absolutely. Number one. Number two, geometry. If it's a heat treated cube, you're not cutting much, maybe on the edge. If it's heat treated sphere, you're definitely not cutting much, I'd say. Um, would be difficult. Would be difficult. But as long as you have some kind of blade geometry and a good heat treat, it's going to cut. I mean, look at this Topps Hoffman Harpoon. Y yes, you have some paracord here for a handle, but you've essentially got a heat treated blade shaped piece of steel. This is, good. this is better than anything our ancestors had when they uh, broke open the, uh, the first rock to form the first survival knife, those sharpened rock edges. Far and away, definitely two most important things. Second most, or sorry, third most important things, I'm gonna go with ergonomics. Again, still way more important than steel selection, which I think a lot of people, that's the first thing they look at when you know they're browsing the, uh, the website. And it's why a lot of things are, you know, better than some steel or some knives with quote unquote better steels because the knife is a better design and it doesn't even have to be like a fully contoured handle to be ergonomic you have to have enough ergonomy for lack of a better word for well, it to work um it probably is actually some will correct us i would think we'll look it up later um but even like you know back to this se5 right here this is you know, a very purpose-driven knife. It's a big tank, it's a bruiser. It doesn't have a super slicey geometry, but it's got geometry. It doesn't have a super, shall we say super spelt or comfortable handle, but it's got enough comfort in the handle that it works. As long as you've got those three things, heat treat, geometry, and some ergon ergonomics, I almost said ergonomy again, top three. Far and away, far, far more important, important? All kinds of new words today. <laughs> far more important than anything else, shall we say. So that, that's the top three for sure. Um, next up, number four, I'm gonna add something you uh, didn't have in your list and that's blade shape. Because after you've got the, you know, the basic building blocks of something that you can hold and will cut, it's gotta be, you know, it's, it's, you wanna optimize it to what you're gonna be cutting. Um, and obviously some of the, uh, the geometry and everything can go into that. But for instance, like that Hoffman harpoon right there, 
I don't think anyone would call this like a skinning knife, that sort of thing. You might want a different shape. You might want a little bit more belly. So I'm going to add that in at number four. Uh, after that, now I'll, let, now I'll let Steel Choice come into uh, the selection. Um, because now, now we've, we've got the building blocks. Now we can improve certain elements of the other building blocks. Maybe that wasn't the best analogy. Oh, well. Um, so we'll let Steel Choice come into the selection here. And it's not always, you know, when we, when we think of, or when, when a lot of folks browse knives today, certain steels are, get categories into better or worse. It's not always the better steel that's best for the intended use, for the context that you mentioned. Uh, so blade shape and blade steel now, depending on context, become more important and can start weighing into the, uh, the factor or factor into the equation. All right, next up, we're gonna go to handle material. And in some cases, your handle material can be paracord, like this, uh, like this Hoffman harpoon right there. Uh, but moreover, just like the steel selection, you want the handle material selection to support your context. You might want a lightweight knife, in which case a skeletonized knife like this with a, a paracord wrap could be right for you. Or it could be, you know, like a, uh, the Benchmade bug out, like the gri lightweight grivery handles. Or you might want something more robust, something that like this SE5 might have micarta handles that are very tough. But now th these things are less essential than the top three, the blade, heat treat, geometry, and the ergonomics of how you're going to hold the blade. Um, after that, you know, you talk about uh, blade length, uh, which we're, we're going we're gonna to kind of fold that into the blade shape uh, that we talked about before. You know, you want it to support your mission. But lock choice, opening method, you know, context is everything. You don't need a lock or an opening method to have a solid knife design otherwise. Like, far, far less important in the hierarchy of needs, I'd say. I feel like I'm rambling here a little bit, but I think I'm, I'm happy with that order. I'm happy with that philosophical look. Almost had weeds. Um, oh, did I avoid the weeds this time? Mm, you got close. I won't know until I see this, uh, this edit go up. A couple dandelions. couple dandelions poking up. See the seeds like drifting across the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but let me know your guys' you know, hierarchy of, of, you know... Maybe this person was asking like what, what goes into how or what f factors into how I choose a knife, what I look for when I'm looking for a knife. Maybe you guys will have fun answering it from that perspective. But I wanted to take it in this, uh, this more kind of philosophical breakdown. We'll go from there. Uh, next question comes from question mark. Appropriate. <laughs> Does a mirror polish offer anything besides beauty when using? Would it be more slicey maybe versus a knife with a stonewashed finish? Uh, could it catch a sunbeam towards making a fire if needed when out in the wilds? Thanks for your time. Well, I'd say apart from making Thomas's job harder when he goes to shoot close-ups because he's got to worry about uh, the reflections here. And fingerprints. And fingerprints, yeah, that's, you see me. I always like wipe a case blade open um, when I, or, or wipe it off when I open the blade. This is a, uh, a nice large folding hunter from Case, by the way. Cool jig bone for the handles. Um, let's go through. Um, slicier than a stonewashed blade? Not really. Um, Actually, I don't have a stonewashed blade here on the table. No, I do not. Um, oh, Thomas has a stonewashed reverse Tonto blade over here. Yes. Check out his uh, well-loved ZT55. No longer available, but between these two, you're not going to really notice a difference, I don't think, between you know slicing, cutting efficiency, that sort of thing. Um, maybe like on a, a microscopic, scientific level, but practically, nah. Now, if you're dealing with, ignore the difference in blade geometries between these two, but if you're dealing with the same blade with a mirror polish versus a heavy like powder coating, like this um, you see on the SE5, yeah, that can definitely uh, make a difference. The, uh, the powder coating is not gonna feel as efficient when you're slicing through. Um, what was the next question? Could it catch a sunbeam towards making a fire? Yeah, no, I, I, I can't see that ever happening. I mean, you just look right here. You can see on my hand, there's a line of reflection, but in order to start a fire from you know, reflected sunlight, you actually need something like this right here. Uh, the Solar Scientific, this is the, one of the funniest names, uh, the 
Tinder hot box solar fire starter. You need that concave dish in this case. So now look at my hand here. Let's see if I, I was doing it earlier. There we go. You can see how Thomas might not have a great angle at this, but it's starting to focus the light of these uh, studio lamp lamps into a single point. It's not gonna be enough to start a fire in here, I hope, <laughs> but. Be an interesting video at that ooh, point. Sure would, uh, but that, that's what you're gonna need. And this is a pretty cool unit actually. It's like 30 bucks. You've got the parabolic reflector there. You've got a little section here or a little piece that pops out and that then pops into the dish. So it holds your tinder at just the, uh, the right optimal distance for the focus but you're not gonna get that out of a, uh, a mirror polished knife. Just not gonna happen. Um, you can potentially harness some of the reflections from a, uh, from a mirror polished knife as, as a quote unquote signal mirror. Now you're never gonna equal the re reflectivity of a true signal mirror, like maybe this UST right here. But if you don't have one and you do have a mirror polished knife in a pinch, you know, the way you would aim it catch the rays of the sun, line it up right beneath your eye, right up here. And then you have your, uh, your two fingers extended in a V. So you've got them lined up kind of like a gun sight basically. And you try to flash whatever in the distance you're trying to hit. And if you see the reflections on either side of your fingers, then you know you've, you're sending that beam straight through them and hopefully you're getting it where you want to go. Not as, again, Signal mirrors are cheap and, uh, and very lightweight, so I'd recommend carrying one of those in your emergency gear. Um, the only other thing um, where a mirror polish kind of really comes into play, again, apart from aesthetics, is the more polished any given steel is, the more stainless it is in a way, the more resistant to corrosion because you're, you know, you're basically sanding over and polishing up any kind of open pores that might be in that particular steel. You, know, you mentioned stonewashed. Stonewash is kind of a close runner up because it's kind of a random patterned polish in a way, you know, not, not as highly polished as a mirror polish, but you know, you've, you've got that same kind of theory or same kind of concept working. Um, complete opposite end of the spectrum on an uncoated blade would be like a bead blasted blade that actually opens up more pores and you're going to make it more, uh, corrosion prone, shall we say? Um, yeah, I'd say that's, that's about it for mirror polish comes right down to it though. Um, most, you know, you're, you're probably not going to have to be worrying about the corrosion aspect these days. Most of it comes down to aesthetics and making Thomas's job more difficult, which is always kind of fun. Thanks for that. Should I leave this here or do you want it back? Oh, well, he might have to shoot some B-roll of this later. So we'll leave, we'll leave it here on the table. All right. Next question comes from Ken Ren 2703. I am a Benchmade owner and I love their knives, but my question is this, why do they continue to stick with S30V as their default steel rather than quote upgrading to something such as S35VN? I know the butterfly has its cost, but you can buy a very nice S35VN knife for the price of an S30V Benchmade. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned S30V as their base steel because I think, oh man, what, I think this happened like three, three years ago was when the uh, Griptilian upgraded from 154 CM to S30V. Uh, so not very long ago at all, S30V was still an upgrade option. Um, but let's compare, I think it, it, it's useful in this case to compare to Spyderco, uh, between Benchmade and Spyderco. Perennial matchup, I know. Um, the Griptilian here with S30V, the Para 3, or sorry, Paramilitary 2 comes with S45 VN now. But interestingly, at one point, we'll, we'll get off on the tangent first and then, and then get into reasons why uh, Benchmade might stick with a, a given steel for a little longer. S35VN is, there's an argument to be made that that's not actually an upgrade over S30V. It all comes back to context we talked about earlier. What are you, you know, looking for your knife to do? There was a period of time where Spyderco took their PM2 from S30V to S35VN. And then they went back to S30V. Why would they do that? Well, S35VN I think has a reputation of being more premium, but if you want edge retention, if that's your primary concern between the two, S30V is gonna have a little bit more of an edge on the edge retention front, and it's a little bit more affordable too. So why wouldn't they stick with S30V over S35VN? The S35 is gonna be a little bit tougher. So again, 
all depends on context. But let's come back to Spyderco. Spyderco is kind of like one of the, the premier like enthusiast companies out there because they aren't afraid to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks in terms of steel selection. They are excited, they're nerds just like us and want to experience all of what the modern metallurgical landscape can offer. So they're gonna give you a ton of different options. The downside of that though, is if you're not a, an, an Uber nerd, like, you know, like I am, like Thomas isn't, but um, if Those you're- different things. If you, yeah, that's true. Um, if you're not the, uh, you know, super into that side of the enthusiast base, it can be very confusing to see this huge, huge swath of steels to select from. So it, it can be hard to know like, what do you want, what to pick? Benchmade doesn't you kind of, they, you know, they do use plenty of different steels. Uh, I'm excited to see them using more crew wear and CPMD2 in their lineup recently, but it's a much narrower focus compared to something like Spyderco. And in a way that's easier to communicate to their customers, the advantages of one over the other. And if you're switching up the base steel every, you know, in this case it would be you know, a three to four year switch since they moved up to S30V in this case, you have to, to re-explain every time. And that can, that can pose some issues from a, a company standpoint. Um, so by streamlining the lineup, they eliminate that a little bit. Also the other thing, if you're a company that's gonna, going to offer a robust warranty, like Benchmade does, then there's value in sticking to a smaller number of products you know, or smaller number of materials that you know work well and you can stand behind rather than spreading out and doing everything under the sun. Spyderco certainly stands behind all of their things they do with uh, throwing everything, every steel under the sun at it, but that's added risk. So all added risk will affect or can affect the bottom line. So that's another reason why they might not. Um, what else? I had a couple other notes here. What do we, what do we see here? Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of it. Do I understand why they don't use more? Yeah. Would I enjoy a Griptilian and S45 VN? Yeah, I sure would. Um, but another tangent though, S30V is still good stuff. Like it's still a solid performing steel. Um, if you don't think so, let me know in the comments. I'm eager to hear that. But you know, knives, the steel on a knife and knives in general, they're not like graphics cards for your computer. They're not obsolete next season, you know? This thing is gonna hold an edge just as well today or just as well 10 years from now as it does today. Just because there might be better stuff out there doesn't mean this still doesn't offer a lot of performance. So there you go. That, that would be my, my take on the subject. As um, if the stuff we have to cut gets harder next year. Mostly, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm searching for something that, that might apply, but you know. Man, you know what I would love though? It would be really cool. I'd love to see a crew wear blade on the, uh, on the Griptilian. That'd be neat. Just okay. saying, just saying, just saying. Nerd. Yes, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I, I wear it with pride. Uh, next question comes from Nemo. Uh, I think you misunderstood the fixed blade versus folder question in last week's Knife AQ. Yes, I did. And several of you pointed this out to me and thanks. Uh, it seemed like the questioner was ask, actually asking which folding knives out there do you think would also be good in a fixed blade version? Yeah, I, I kind of bungled that when I talked about the differences in strength of locks versus you know fixed blades and that sort of thing. Um, so let me retackle that question now. Some folders that I think uh, I, that I would probably wind up purchasing, uh, or at least being very uh, excited about if they released a fixed blade version. I'm going to go with an Open L, a number nine right here. Really cool folder. Not exactly like a robust tool like the SE5 we looked at earlier, but always been a super comfortable knife to hold. It's kind of already got the soul of a fixed blade in how it's made in the, in the ergonomi of the handle, the ergonomics of the handle. It just is really cool. And I think it would be really neat to see a, uh, a fixed blade version, even if it was a, a partial tang and not a, a full tang knife, um, that would seem very appropriate. And I think would be really cool. Um, I also think a lot of cold steels folders would be phenomenal fixed blades. Uh, in fact, they kind of, you know, some of them like this ultimate hunter really do kind of carry the soul of a fixed blade in them already. And this was my, I immediately was like, Ooh, ultimate hunter maybe. But then I thought for 
That was after thinking for one second. After thinking for two seconds, I remembered the uh, the Pendleton Hunter <laughs> in Cold Steel's lineup. So the, the fixed blade and, uh, equivalent already pretty much exists right there. Um, AD10 would be awesome as a fixed blade, but something a little more obscure in their lineup. I think the Bush Ranger would be an awesome kind of tactical fixed blade if it made the jump from the folder to the fixed blade. Now I, I had a second of hesitation there. Am I missing something? They might already have this as well as a fixed blade or have had. They'll tell us. Let us know in the comments section, please and thank you. Um, really cool knife. I mean, this guy, S35VN blade. Is it an upgrade over S30V or not? You let me know. Uh, actually, I, I like the extra toughness on this particular design. Three and a half inches, 128 bucks. It's a cool knife. Triad lock. Actually, is this a triad lock? Yes, it is a triad lock. Um, had to look inside to make sure. Look under the hood, so to speak. That'd be a cool fixed blade. You've already got kind of the offset hilt thing going on there. Um, reminds me a little bit of some like loveless stuff in a way. Um, really cool. That'd be a neat fixed blade. Let me know your guys' folders you'd like to see as fixed blades in the comments. All right, now we come to the lightning round for today. Uh, first questions from Jacob D. Hutt. Uh, DCA, three dream knives, no matter the cost. Well, I mean, channel regulars, you guys know I love uh, the Nesmuk blade shape. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, here is a Abrisa Nesmuk, 145 bucks. And it's kind of got this characteristic hump out near the top. And it was designed by uh, George Washington Sears, AKA Nesmuk, in some of his outdoor writings, uh, late 1800s. Probably getting my years wrong at this point. Um, I really, I just, I love the artfulness of that. Uh, so there's a few Nesmucks that I, that I dream about that I don't have and probably never will. Uh, Cole Klesser Brothers Nesmuk would be sweet. They're the same folks that made uh, and marketed the original Kephart knife. And there's a, like one or two of these like floating around still, as far as I know. Uh, a Bob Loveless Nesmuk. Super cool, super awesome looking. And I certainly can't afford one. And as long as we're dreaming, the original Nesmuk too. No one knows what happened to the knife that was sketched out in, uh, in those articles. Um, but as long as we're dreaming, I'll go for that too. Next question, Tani Di Souza. Can I take machete to airport? Um, caveat right up front, we're not lawyers and I'm also not a TSA agent. So, well, we know Joe Flowers brings machetes back from the Amazon when he comes back. You should be able to check it in your check baggage, I believe. Don't, don't go walking around with it strapped to your hip or, you know, don't be an idiot. Um, but if you're thinking, if you're going on a trip, stick to something that's, you know, not too big and not too expensive. This Marbles Bolo might be a, uh, a pretty decent choice. It's like 15 bucks right here, 14 inch blade. You could certainly go more compact. A 12 incher is gonna do well for you too. Don't be an idiot. Don't, don't, check bag. Don't take it into the terminal. US airports at the very least. Yeah, I, I can't speak to anything outside our, these borders here at the moment. Uh, next question comes from Harry Crab. Is there some reason why I shouldn't be terrified by that Spyderco one-handed lock release towards fingers thingy uh, that everyone does. You mean uh, this right here? Oh, this one needs a little bit of breaking in. That guy? As long as you know what you're doing, it's, it's pretty fine because the advantage of the compression lock here is your fingers never cross the path of the blade when you're disengaging that lock. You're pushing from the back and it's going towards you. I've never cut myself. Someone probably has out there though. Should you be terrified of it? It's a personal choice. Next question, the most serious question of the day comes from Sid1. Uh, DCA, when you made the sound effects for the intro to the Knife AQ videos, were there other people around? That's Thomas, guys. <laughs> Thomas put that together. We're both kind of Monty Python fans. He took a, a doot doot do that I was doing somewhere as I was, you know, as, as a thought was loading, but that was him going over there doing the. Yeah, I made it at home and my wife had uh, some raised eyebrows. <laughs> well, she was your girlfriend at the time, so she's still your wife, so obviously didn't scare her off. Clearly knows what she's getting into. Yeah, that poor woman. Um, I love that intro. I, I really do. It's cheesy, but I enjoy it very much. All right, that's all the questions I've got for you folks today. If you want a chance for your question to be featured in a future episode, you know what to do. Drop them in the comments below. 
If you want to get your hands on any of these knives or other gear apart from Thomas's ZT, which you can't have, uh, there will be links in the description per usual that'll take you over to knifecenter.com. Make sure you sign up for our Knife Rewards program while you're at it, because if you're going to spend your money on one of these knives, you might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center, signing off. See you next time.